good morning, everyone. And um, I'm Diane Smith, and I'm really pleased to be your MC today. And this virtual chat session is with Cam McIntyre, who's the CEO and Managing Director at carsales.com limited. I would first like to uh, take this opportunity to acknowledge the um, advisory board members of the Melbourne Chamber who are on the line, Brendan Britton, I can see you Brendan and Kieran Fitzpatrick. Uh, Brendan's from Pitcher Partners, Kieran's from Delaware North and of course, Joe Allen, who's from carsales.com, uh, who might have had a, a say in, in um, coercing Cam to be our guest. Um, so welcome everyone. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our newest member, who is Chris Pierce, uh, managing partner of a DB Results. It's fantastic to have you um, on board with Melbourne Chamber, Chris, and, and we welcome you most warmly. The format of today's session, it'll be an interactive conversation uh, that Paul Guerra, the Chief Executive of the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, will have with CAM. And I know Cam is very um, willing to share his, not only his personal leadership insights, but of course, the really interesting story of carsales.com, which is the largest online automotive, motorcycle and marine classified business in Australia, and undoubtedly a great local and now global uh, business success story in terms of technology and disruption. You're all in a Zoom meeting, and this is recorded, uh, but please treat it like you're just sitting around a table and we're having a conversation. I can see you, Sally Curtin, smiling, so hi. Um, <clears throat> and when we get to the Q&A, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up and ask a question. It's a small group and that's how we wanted to have it this morning. It's an intimate discussion. So um, if you wouldn't mind um, continuing to mute as you all have done until the Q&A session, and please feel free to just post comments in the, in the chat function. So to introduce Cam, Cam McIntyre was appointed the Managing Director and the CEO of carsales.com Limited in 2017. Prior to this, um, he held the positions of Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer and Company Secretary um, of, the, of the company, including overseeing the IPO of the company in 2009. Now, I spoke secretly to one of Cam's executive team members and I asked them about this introduction and said, well, what are the three things, the three words that would describe Cam best as a boss and a leader? This person said, well, it's easy, inspiring, genuine, and has a great sense of humor. And also he actually hates to talk about himself. So this person is really looking forward to watching the next 45 minutes with great interest. So it's an exclusive opportunity, everyone. And it's now my pleasure to hand over to Paul and Cam for the MCC member chat. Thanks, Don. Uh, welcome, Cam. Thanks, Paul. It's nice to be here. It's the first time I've worn a shirt, mate, in about six months. <laughs> I don't even put a shirt on for our investor call. So, uh, so you've, you've got me actually wearing a decent shirt today. Yeah, no, that's good. Love the backdrop as well. If only you were down uh, where the backdrop is. I thought we might, um, with that introduction from Di, we might sort of want a bit about your career first. Look a little bit about where um, carsales.com um, is at. And then finally, just a bit of leadership. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've had a chat just briefly then about one of the things that you're doing, but I think it'd be some really good insights. And then, you know, perhaps talk about, you know, how COVID's affected uh, carsales.com across Australia, particularly from a Victorian uh, perspective as well. So you're okay with that? Let's yeah. jump in. No worries. A bit about your career. You know, I know you're at Census before um, cars, coming across to car sales. What were the roles? What inspired you to move across to car sales along the way? Oh, so, I mean, I, I'd probably break my career down into two two components. So, um, so part A of my career was probably more around manufacturing, and um, and we used to have a, a pretty decent manufacturing sector in in Victoria. So, um, my my career, first part of my career, was you know, companies like um, a British American Tobacco in Virginia Park uh, in Melbourne. Uh, L'Oreal, which had a, a decent factory in, in Sandringham, um, and then another company called Email Limited, uh, which was a big conglomerate, and we used to make um, Simpson, Westinghouse, Frigidaire, Kelvinator, White Goods, um, Lockwood Locks, Dorf Taps, um, Email Air Conditioning Systems, um, uh, here in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne too, largely, and a lot of that's no longer, no longer here. Um, so I'd say that's part A of my, my career, and I, I really liked the, the manufacturing sector because um, 
great sense of community, um, you know, a lot of discipline, a lot of precision product being being built, and the satisfaction you got from actually creating something um, that consumers wanted to consume. Tobacco products aside, but um, uh, but yeah, it was it was it was great. But yeah, a lot of that that industry's gone, and and that was probably part A of my career, and then around 2000, um, sort of saw the writing on the wall and um, was approached to join uh, Census, um, was called Pacific Access in those days. Yeah. And um, Pacific Access was the jewel in the crown of Telstra. It was the, um, it was the advertising arm of Telstra. Um, used to spin off a, a lot of cash uh, and produce the yellow pages and white pages directory type products and, and those sorts of things. And, um, that industry uh, evolved um, over time as well. So I went from traditional sort of uh, print advertising to, to more digital product. And I don't know if you remember um, one day the, the, the CEO of Telstra at the time, um, famous, famous line said, Google schmoogle. I don't know if you remember yep. Sol Trujillo saying that. Um, and, um, and that was sort of um, uh, a bit indicative of where the where the business was heading. We we could see um, a disruption coming from from Google, but the push was was back into into print. So, um, I, uh, I I was I was lucky enough to um, when I was at Census and I was the the finance director at Census, I was lucky enough to um, be sent to do a course at Harvard, and this really okay. set me up for um, the change in in my career. And it was a great, a great thing to do, but um, there was just one pr presenter that, that made an absolute pivotal difference to, to where I'm at today. And uh, was, he's a guy called uh, John Cotter. And I don't know if, you, if you've ever, ever read anything that John Cotter's written. He wrote the book on, on um, change management for, for companies. So he wrote this book called uh, Leading Change. And it's, it's, about, it's about a whole, a, a, a penguin colony. Literally, it's about a penguin colony <laughs> um, living on a on a on, on a piece of ice in the Antarctic, and with um, with global warming, their ice pack starts to melt. And um, and it, the book talks about well, what do they do? How do they manage this disruption in their lives? And how do they how do they survive? Um, and it's and it's a, a really interesting book, but it's not the moral of the story. Um, the moral of the story was there was uh, in this class uh, at the end of the class. Um, one person asked a, a question of this guy, John Cotter, and said, well, if you had one piece of advice to everyone in the room about how you lead your lives, what would it be? And, um, and he said one thing, and it was, life is short, do something cool. And, um, and that stuck with me um, to, to this day. So I, I came home, um, back to census, and within uh, six months of that, was approached by this, this little company, Operating out of a out of a shop front in Oakley, um, about sixty people, um, and we we'd spent a, a bit of time at Census studying digital marketplace businesses, and um, and I knew yeah you know, a lot about car sales and um, and where car sales was going, and it was um, it was car sales. So I went from a company of about three thousand people doing uh, about nine hundred million dollars of profit to um, to a company of sixty doing next to nothing, all off the back of one guy saying something to me, which was life is short, do something cool. And, um, and I, I guess, you know, that, that was, that was it. I mean, it was a, a massive yeah. pivot. Um, and, and since that day, you know, lot, lots of, lots of exciting, lots of exciting experiences um, at car sales. So the, the step then, right, to move out of the comfort zone into yep. carsales.com your thought process in doing that? Because I imagine it wouldn't have been a snap decision. It would have been something that you were building up to. And to finally take that leap into the unknown um, is what many people confront in the career. How did you do it? What did you go through? Um, so I think, I think a number of things. So first, uh, understanding the marketplace, understanding um, how technology was evolving, where disruption. I mean, ha having spent you know the previous ten years in a, in an industry in a whole in an industry that was completely disrupted, and um, and and working in a business where you knew disruption was coming, it was pretty yeah. clear where the market was moving, and it was moving to digital. So, um, so understanding that, understanding um, you know, I, I love cars, so that 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 helped, um, and uh, and you know the the people in the business were fantastic. You know, we had 
James Packer on the board, yeah. um, Greg uh, Roebuck, um, fantastic bloke. And um, yeah, my second interview with Greg was a, a beer at the pub. And um, so, you yeah, know, that was, that was that was great. So aside from the the research side, understanding where the market was going, for me it was about the people and it was about the excitement of the opportunity, but also um, you yeah, know moving to an organisation that was a startup pretty much. I mean, yeah. um, and and just having that startup mentality and moving out of the corporate environment was was the exciting bit. Did um, when you made the move, did you factor in the potential for an IPO and then? Um, listing and, and as part of that, did you factor in a long term career for you within carsales.com? Yeah, so so when I started there, um, we we had probably the worst corporate structure that you'd want to ever have, um, which is a public unlisted company. So, yeah. so that structure is uh, you've got all the accountability um, of a public company in terms of you know AGMs and looking after shareholders, but you have no liquidity um, yeah. at all. And you know, the, the commitment that was made by PBL Media was that one day they would allow car sales to, to IPO. We had about 530 or 20 shareholders, give or take. Um, and so, and that was all fine, but, um, but we, were, we were disrupted by the, the GFC. So the GFC hit us in, right. in 2008. Um, and uh, yeah, it's sort of pretty familiar with you know, where a lot of companies are now, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, thinking about an IPO. And in a market like this, um, IPO windows are really short and narrow. Uh, and so for us, we, um, we had a, a parent company that wasn't that interested in us IPOing in the first place because there was no upside for them. They, were already a public, uh, they weren't a public company at the time. They were owned by CVC, which is private equity. But... Um, um, they weren't that interested. We obviously were. Um, so you had that conflict. And then you had a, a GFC that you were trying to navigate through at the same time. So, so we iced our IPO. Um, mm. and, we, um, and we had to pick it up again in, in 2009. Um, in September 2009, we eventually, we eventually got away. But um, just coming back to that, those windows, uh, the windows shut again. I reckon probably November and Maya tried to get their IPO away and they got it away, but um, it was, it was tough as, as we yeah. all remember. So when, when we IPO, I mean, one of the, one of the interesting um, data points and this goes to disruption again. Um, so when we IPO, if you took our market cap, um, yep. you added Seek's market cap and you added REA's market cap because we're all public companies um, that equaled the market cap of Fairfax. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you roll forward, you know, three years from, from, from there, if you just took our market cap alone, our market cap was bigger than Fairfax's. And, um, and you look today and Fairfax is now a part, of, a part of nine. So, I mean, the interesting point there, again, it just goes to you know, how quickly markets move and, and how quickly things can change. Um, and disruption can come, and um, uh, and yeah, that that's that's certainly been um, one of the things that you know, as as a business at car sales, we we're, we're very conscious of. There's no doubt, you know, carsales.com and and seek.com, which are great Victorian businesses, have have trailblazed through. Do you, do you ever look back and say, actually, we, we've trailblazed it, and these are the companies that followed us um, through the gap that you created? Uh, yeah, I think. Um, you, you you don't have a lot of time to sit back and reflect. I mean, one of the things we're not very good at is sitting back and smelling the roses, or maybe it's just me. I don't tend to do it much. And um, uh, so not re ever looking in the rear view mirror, it's what's coming next. Um, but I mean, I think, I think one of the things that, that we don't do a great job of is actually recognizing the capability that we have in this state um, around technology. Yep. And if you think about it, I mean, car sales, we would be one of the biggest um, automotive marketplaces, not just in Australia, but in the world. And, yep. you know, when it comes to um, you know, growing our business offshore, I mean, uh, everyone knows who we are in any country around the world. They've all heard of us. They all, they've all followed us. Um, and it's the same for Seek and it's the same for REA. And the intellectual property and capability that we have um, as organisations, I think, you know, is, is something that um, we should be proud of as, as a state. 
uh, you know, we've, we've created this, um, this ecosystem that we have. And I think that's, that's that, as you say, it's opened up um, uh, for other companies to sort of do the same sorts of things. And, and you know, we have this ecosystem in, in Cremorne um, now where we're all sort of huddled together. Um, but, it's, uh, but it is something that's it's fantastic and we, and we love. Yeah, it's, I, I can tell you I've spoken about carsales.com and seek.com um, specifically with a couple of ministers and the treasurer over the past fortnight because I believe one of the recovery points for Victoria is off the back of, of you know, the, the sector that you've created and there is a lot to be learnt uh, from that. I want to come back to a, an organisation of 60 people would have had a particular culture when you joined. The organisation today is, is not only much larger, but operates in different countries um, as well. You know, my experience is, is culture is the glue that, that really enables growth and holds the team um, together. I've had a bit to do with um, Joe and your team and she's just fabulous and I can see why the culture is as strong as what it is. But in your view, not only the culture that exists now, but the transition from what it was at 60 people to what it is today and, and keeping that culture alive and vibrant. Yeah, no, look, I mean, <clears throat> culture, um, culture definitely has to evolve um, as you go from a, from a startup to a, to a, a global, a global business. And, you know, I would, I would say that, um, you know, we've probably held on to elements of our startup culture too long. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's created some issues uh, along the way, and but yeah, I mean, in a startup, um, yeah, you're, you're given a business card when you start, <clears throat> and my business card said chief financial officer, and and that's all wonderful, but it doesn't really mean anything because in a startup, you're doing everything, and um, and it's a wonderful part of being in a startup. Uh, the title on your business card just says your core competency, but otherwise, you're expected to when the building floods as ours did, um, you know, rip up the carpet and replace the furniture and, you know, um, or you're expected to get out and talk to customers and do, do, do whatever it takes um, to help the business pivot and, and evolve. Um, and so, you know, th there's, there's that, there's, you know, you're only ever one conversation away from making a change in the company's business model or uh, making a change in, in a, in a product. You know, if you want to, if you want to communicate with the team, you all stand around the photocopier and you have a conversation. Um, and I remember the old days where you know, there would be 50 people literally standing around a photocopier having a, having a conversation. Um, and, and, that's, and that's all great and it's all fantastic um, and it's invigorating and everyone feels engaged and, um, and, and so on. But as the business grows, you've really got to watch that. Um, and you've got to watch it because what tends to happen is you tend to leak around things like collaboration um, you tend to leak a little bit around communication um, and engagement tends to you know, be a little bit more challenging. You've got to, you've got to have business process. You can't just have a conversation and, uh, and iterate on the spot. Um, you've got to have some process there. So, you know, that's, 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 a, that's always a challenge. And you know, a lot of people talk about the pain involved when, when businesses shrink um, and, you um, and there's always challenge around that, but there's also significant challenge around growth. I mean, it's yeah. a much better challenge to have, but but nonetheless, it's very challenging moving from a from a startup um, into a into a into a global company. I mean, just think about things like um, so. We've got a, a number of businesses in in Latin America, um, so yeah. Chile, Argentina, and Mexico, and their native language is Spanish, not not English. Yeah. So you know, things like language become become a challenge and. You know, in our in our business, you know, we had at one stage, I think it was probably fifty or sixty people learning Spanish um, to cope with that. So it's, mm. yeah, how do you how do you evolve um, in on many different fronts uh, is 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 a challenge, but good challenge to have. It's interesting because the the distribution um, across um, the globe right now that that you've been through, some of us are experiencing it uh, for the first time in terms of as you say that photocopy of conversation isn't happening and hasn't happened for six months. So we've, we've all had to get used to communicating remotely. And I know talking to Paul Barlow in, in your team, I think a lot of your team would have a much better appreciation in terms of the, the work that Paul and his team is doing, not being able to see his staff face to face every day. And, and I'm sure a lot of us have been through that as well. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, time differences, language, culture, um, 
all all very different and people have different expectations and markets are all different so dealing with that in an environment where you where all you get is really zoom um yeah. and you get zoom fatigue anyway uh is is tough yeah so we're in the middle of the pandemic um, hopefully nearing the end um, certainly as i look at the other states um, around australia um, they've done a much better job than what we have and they're in a much better position than what we are and hopefully before too long we'll, we'll be on the track to um, chasing them down. How has it impacted your business first of all from an Australian uh, perspective and then go broader for us in terms of internationally as well? Yeah um, so I mean obviously being a, being a, t a technology company um, the whole notion of of working from home, um, yeah, we we adapted very quickly to that. Um, yeah, a lot of hard work put in by our, our, our tech team um, to get us there. But um, but in terms of moving to that way of working, pretty pretty seamless. And you know, we've got a large tech team, and um, I reckon if if uh, it was a whole bunch of developers on this call right now. Um, and you did a straw poll of who's enjoying working from home. Uh, I reckon most of them would say they're, they're actually quite happy working from home because they're all introverts anyway, and it's all good. Um, and, and I guess, you know, what, what I've found, um, and it's, uh, there was an article in the paper that was saying something similar today, which is, um, yeah, I think what we found as a business is at the start of this, uh, all moving to uh, home-based working was fine because, you know, we, we have tasks to, to complete um, and activity to fulfill and it's, it's point and shoot, right? So it's, so it's easy to get things done. Yeah. As time goes on and, um, and you need to keep innovating, you need to keep collaboration up. Um, you know, I think you know, this sort of environment, it, does, it just doesn't lend itself to that. I mean, the conversations, the corridor conversations that you have where you pick up yeah, you know, a couple of couple of bits of information, and you start piecing some things together, and yeah, you, know, you have those collaboration sessions around whiteboards where you you bring everyone together. Um, that's that's much more of a challenge in in this environment um, for for not not just us, but I think most businesses. And then when you sort of add to that uh, the international component of it, the the time zones, the language, the culture, uh, all the rest of it, it just it uh, it amplifies that um uh, significantly so uh, so for me i think um yeah definitely looking forward to the new ways of working whatever that looks like um but um yeah it's and i think it has it has an impact even on you know the ecosystem that we have in cremorne i mean if you yeah. think about cremorne as a as an enclave you know you've got um seek moving in there um rea uh, are sort of there although they're rea are richmond but they, they'll tell you they're cremorne um you've got myob uh and and a whole bunch of other tech companies um and the collaboration that we have there is 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 fantastic I and mean, we all um we all work collaboratively uh, we're not really competitors we're competitors for talent but we're not competitors for for business uh, most of us yeah. so so that works well but um, what happens to that enclave when we get to the new ways of working and, and people actually don't need to be back in the office? I mean, does, does that does that change that dynamic? I, I don't know. So I guess we'll, we'll, we'll find out sooner or later. It's interesting. Um, Vice-Chancellor Melbourne Uni, Duncan Maskell, a really clever uh, comment the other day, said, uh, we're not working from home, we're actually living at work. And it's easy to get caught up in the you know the place that you're working from. You're working extended hours in some cases, but in almost all cases, working different hours um, as well. From an economic uh, perspective, the the hit that we've taken in um, Victoria, are you seeing it through your activity as well? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, yeah, what what we see uh, several things. So, I mean, as, as a country, we're in in our industry at least. Um, or part of our industry, which is used cars, um, yeah, that part of the market's performing very well because uh, you've got you've got people wanting to avoid public transport, right? So everyone's moving back into car ownership. Um, they want to avoid public transport. They can't take international holidays. They can only take interstate holidays. Um, uh, and or if you're living in Victoria, you can only take an intrastate holiday. Yeah. Um, so yeah, people are going. Well, I don't. I can't fly anywhere. Um, I can't go overseas. 
uh, I want to avoid public transport anyway, so, but at least I'm going to have a decent car to drive from you know, point A to point B. Uh, and so what we're seeing is people moving back into car ownership uh, across the country and used cars are, um, uh, have, have been a vehicle for that, pardon the pun. But um, here in Victoria, um, it's, it's, a, it's a different dynamic because we have um, curfews and, and retail is shut and so on. So um, we're not seeing the same level of activity. People can't go out and photograph their car um, and, and place it on, on the website. They, they can do that, but um, what happens when you want someone to, to buy it uh, they're not going to be able to turn up to your house. So people delay those sorts of things. So, so what we're seeing is, um, and, and what we will see is when, when Victoria opens up, there will be a, a kickback in activity that will, that will come back pretty hard and pretty fast because there's a lot of pent up demand that hasn't been, um, hasn't been executed on over the past couple of months. And, uh, and so we'll see a, a, a lift uh, in that, um, which should be, which should be nice. But um, but the rest of the country is actually is actually going okay. Yeah, that's good. Good to see the volumes come back. I know uh, my daughter recently bought a, a car, so she's more familiar with uh, your site than I think most people are. And um, I'm glad she bought the car because by the end of three months of showing me every single car that she found <laughs> over a series and all the features, um, but she got in just before the um, the latest lockdown. And she comments every day, you know, that the amount of cars available in Victoria right now on, on the website is, she said, Dan, I'm glad I bought it. Yeah, well, it's, it's not just that, Paul. She, she would have cost you 20% more if you had bought it today because car prices have all, used car prices have all gone up over the last month or so. And Moody's uh, said, reported last week that they reckon car, used car prices have gone up 25% uh, year on year in the last month. And we know they've gone up. Um, whether it's 25%, um, not sure, but um, but uh, they've all gone up because the supply has has come off and and, and the demand is is huge. Um, new new cars are, are are a problem just just getting them into the country because of component disruption and production disruption in in countries around the world. And we we just need um, we need some more new car stock. Yeah, um, I know um, horse from Mercedes Benz is on the line as well. Chatting to him previously, I know they had a good end of um, June, and obviously, as the next part of superannuation was released as well, and we might get an input from you a bit later on, horse, as to where you're seeing the market as well. So, Cam, we've got probably time for one more before I hand you back to Di. Um, the next six to twelve months, you know, that the challenges that that you know you may face. Um, be keen to understand what you think the biggest um, challenge for you and the team um, is. I think, um, I mean, I'd say no one, no one on this call has the playbook for how you deal with the pandemic. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a bit of um, anticipate as, as, as much as you can. Um, and, and, and maybe you know what the, what the Premier is going to be announcing on, on Sunday, which may give us all a bit of an insight. So maybe I'll ask you that question uh, a little bit later, Paul, as well. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for me, I think there's there's a couple of things uh, over the, ne the next six or 12 months, depending on the timing around when we come out of this. But I think the, the core issues will be around people. So, um, you know, how do we how do we um, get our people back to a place where we are innovating again? And we, we do have that business momentum and we have business momentum now, but it's, it's not the pace that it was. So how do you how do you pick up the pace again? Um, and get everyone um, back on back on track. For me, I think that's the key the key challenge. And, and what shape and form does that take? Uh, I think we're all um, uh, we've all got ideas, but don't have a great sense of how that's going to look at the moment. Um, and then I think the other the other part for us is um, so if, if you look at our business, our business we, um, we we export a lot of our capability, our IP. Um, and our technology to, to our businesses around the world. We're an acquisitive company as well. So we're always looking for new opportunities to grow and evolve. And um, you know, with borders shut, uh, how do you do that? So you know, the, the challenges there are, um, you know, how do you think about that? How do you, you know, what capabilities do you need to bring in um, in order to make sure that you're still executing? Um, so I think you know, that's, that's probably a, a challenge that we'll, we'll have to address too. No, it's great. 
So I'm going to hand you, um, Cam, back to you. I really appreciate it, Cam. I love, I, I love the, um, the quote you go there, life is short, do something cool. <laughs> yeah, that summarises the, you know, the, the boldness in you, I would say. So it's really good. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thanks very much, Cam, and thanks, Paul. Um, look, we've actually got a question already, and I might just throw uh, to Nathan Rayner, who's from Gallagher, um, you know, global insurer. Um, and Nathan was asking, are banks lending cash for used cars, or are people uh, lending money for used cars, or are people just paying cash? It's a good question. Yeah, great, great question. And um, yeah, I really thank the Treasurer this morning um, because uh, he announced um, some changes to, to lending around responsible lending. And you know, for the past two years, we've been talking about how the Hain Royal Commission and you know, changes to responsible lending have just have, have really made it hard for, for our industry to, to sell to sell cars. And you know, if you talk to anyone, I'm sure Horst would say the same thing. Um, you know, the time it takes for people to get credit approval today um, is, has been uh, ridiculous. Uh, weeks and weeks, um, uh, you know, people would um, fill in application forms and if they missed their, their diner's club card that um, you know, had, has next to nothing on it, um, you know, the, the banks would, would change their, um, the, the amount of funding they could get and so, so on. So I think um, the, the changes there will be really welcome relief uh, for the industry um, uh, and, and hopefully um, that will mean more people are, are buying more cars. But I mean, you do, I mean, the, the significant um, percentage of vehicles that are purchased in this country are purchased on credit. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's, it's pretty logical that the, the lower the value of the vehicle, the more likely it is to be purchased with cash. Um, so. Uh, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure your daughter didn't borrow money, um, Paul. I'm sure, or maybe she did from her dad, but um, but it was all paid. My dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it goes. It, it, it depends on the value of the car. Fantastic. I'm now scanning everyone's beautiful faces, and feel free, everyone, to to put your video on, so it makes it a little bit easier. Whether there's any. Oh, there are a couple more questions now. From Nick Hamilton. Nick, you're welcome. Do you want to read that question out or would you like me to? Uh, yeah, no, I'm happy to, happy to die. Thank you. Hi, hi, Cameron. My name is Nick Hamilton. Um, I'm just interested to understand a little bit more about your personal development that you touched on at the start of the presentation. Uh, you talked about the Harvard course that you undertook. Just wondering how that, the learnings that you, you brought back from Harvard and how you've incorporated those into your business dealings you know, through, through the last number of years. Yeah, no, thanks, Nick. Um, for anyone that's been to Harvard uh, or had the chance to study anywhere overseas, I mean, I, I'd describe it as like going, it's like Disneyland for business people. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the breadth of, and the capability of the academia that teaches you, you, know, you come back um, feeling very empowered um, and, and, and far more knowledgeable, right? So yeah, being a finance guy and, and, and having a much better understanding around marketing um, was, was kind of sort of dangerous too, right? Um, but uh, I guess the, the, the principles that, that I got out of that sort of um, that program were around, you know, how do you, um, how do you manage change uh, for me? That was that was a, a big a big learning, and um, you know it's not just simply sitting some people down and saying doing this. It's about you know there's seven steps in in a in a change management process, and how do you how do you go about doing that? Um, was was really quite um, invigorating for me. Um, understanding more about business strategy, um, and uh, you know in the context of um, Pacific Access and, and Telstra. Um, yeah, we, we had a business, we had business direction, but we didn't have great clarity around, around strategy. So that was, that was important. And, and that's helped me as I've, I've evolved my, my career. I think, um, I, I think though, it's more, um, it's more also about the, the opportunity that you get to meet other people and, and, yeah, being in Australia, we have a great ecosystem of business here, uh, but it's not until you actually realize that, Australia is a very small enclave um, relative to what actually happens in the rest of the world. Um, and that 
you know, there are parts of our uh, industry which are leading and parts of our industry which are trailing. Um, the more people you know overseas um, and have better connections to, uh, the, the better the learnings that you get. And for me, half the value in studying overseas was actually getting that network um, and building on that network and having the opportunity to actually understand you know, more about what other people do and bring, bringing that back into what I do as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Thank you. Thank you for, for the response. Um, um, Cam, you, oh, I know Horst is coming up next, but um, I want to introduce you to one of your next door neighbours, Sally Curtin, who heads up Bendigo Kangan Institute. You probably know one another. Sal's got a question. Well. Hi, Cam. How are you? Yeah, talk, you? About, talk about bold, Paul. I'll just give you a little story about Cameron. My first meeting with Cameron was when I was the regulator uh, managing registration of all the vehicles that he's selling. Thank and um, he pitched to me a concept that, um, and the, the registration scheme in Victoria is run off 1960s technology, COBOL code, code, but Cam pitched to me to, to switch from COBOL to blockchain. Uh, so that was my first meeting with Cameron, so that might give you a sense of something bold. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, nice to see you again, Cam. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm one of your neighbours now uh, in, in Cremorne, and uh, I was listening with interest where you talk about that uh, ecosystem that uh, we, we all experience in Cremorne. And, thinking about how public entities work in with, you know, that really strong, strong sort of tech and, and commercial industry and, and, and how we might be able to broker some shared interests there. Yeah, great, great question. I mean, as we come out of this, um, for me, I mean, one of, my, one of my concerns as we come out of this is the fact that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be um, misplaced, I guess, or they're, they're, they're out of they're out of jobs, industries have changed. You know, we've probably evolved more in the last six months around technology and digitization of our economy than we have in the last 10 years, right? I mean, it's, mm. just, it's just accelerated so quickly. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of people that don't have those digital skills um, that they're gonna need in order to, to pivot their own careers. Uh, and so, so for me, it, the question is, how does industry with, um, education and universities and government come together to create um, the right environment to help people change their careers and move um, uh, and, and get the digital skill sets that we're all going to need um, in the world moving forward. And that hasn't been an easy problem to solve to date, Sal. So mm -hmm. you know, we've, um, we've spent a lot of time on that. And you know, we've got a director on our board who's very um, uh, focused on that as well. But uh, for me, that's that's a bit of a passion project, and Joe knows that too. And uh, I'd I'd like to see us doing more in that space, um, particularly around vocational learning. Um, I think there's, there's a really big opportunity, but it's just how do we get it done, um, and how do we get government involved? I think is the is the the missing piece. So it'd be great to work with you on that. And uh, and the other thing too is we still haven't got blockchain up. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, was going to, I was too scared to ask. Uh, Vic Rose is still on Cobalt. And, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> and only. Still trying. Uh, I saw Gus on the call. Gus, have you fixed that, mate? <laughs> All good. Um, um, not yet, Cam. I'm <laughs> still working on it. <laughs> hi, Gus. Uh, hi, how are you? Good. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry I turned off my uh, video because my background is not as pretty as you all. I'm just in uh, my small corner and you can hear my baby's screaming from behind. Yeah. Now, I think, Horst, did you take yourself off speaker? I, um, ah, I beg your pardon. Oh, on behalf yeah. of, sorry about that. On behalf of Horst, and can I just say, Horst is going to be leaving the role of Managing Director of Mercedes-Benz um, Australia. Since he's been in the seat, the sales of Mercedes-Benz cars has quadrupled. Um, so, you know, well done, Horst, and um, happy to take a question or just to make a statement about your contribution. You know, firstly, they certainly haven't quadrupled because of me, but despite of me, so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously great to, to listen to Cameron and uh, Cam would know that uh, I'm passionate about uh, disruption because I think we will experience far more disruption in our industry than uh, most people think. And it's always good to see 
you know, a company like car sales to, to be a trailblazer in that disruption field. And we take a lot of, of inspiration from these companies to reshape our way of, of, of retailing cars in the future. And we're in the midst of that. Uh, it's a bit too early to say too much about it because it's a, it's a tough gig because there is nothing as conservative as the car industry and especially car retail. So I'm actually almost a bit sad to, to step out before the job will be done, but I'll be watching it from the sidelines. So. <laughs> Well done, Cameron, in the past, and uh, I might give you a few calls for some, some ideas how to, to push it forward. No, I owe I, I, you a call, host, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure I de deliver on that. And, and congratulations to you two on, on your career at Mercedes-Benz. I mean, you're the longest serving CEO of any car company in the, in the country, and, and you've done an amazing job. Uh, at Mercedes-Benz and, and some of the change that you know, Mercedes-Benz are, are making now is, as you say, it's, you know, it's, it's pursuing um, you know, the market as the market evolves and, and congratulations to you because there's some big decisions in, in all of that. Um, yeah. and you, you've, had, you've had some great months of trading, I know. So, um, so that, well done. Well yeah, done. Thank you. Thanks. And we've just got two quick questions and I'm going to invite Anitha De Silva from Oricon to ask one. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, Cameron, thank you very much for your comments. Very, very interesting. Um, I just had a couple of questions. I've recently joined uh, Victorian Government's Launch Vic Board and um, with Lee Jasper as the um, chair, who you may know. Um, I guess what I'm interested in hearing from you is, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing Victorian companies from moving from startup to scale up? And I guess the second part of that question is, what do you think um, what do you think about the government's current policy settings? What are, do you think that there's opportunities to improve that federal government as well as Victorian government? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, great, great questions. I think um, yeah, moving from from startup, uh, yeah, I think we, we, yeah we've got a we've got a good ecosystem uh, here in in Victoria and now, um, particularly centred around around Cremorne. There's there's a lot of startup uh, activity. That, that's going on or was going on sort of six months ago. I think, you know, for me, um, there's, there's some, there is some missing pieces uh, and, you know, the, the state government is or was developing a, um, a, a technology hub. I think it was going to be up in Carlton somewhere, um, which is interesting, but, uh, you know, all the tech companies are in Cremorne um, and, you know, I would have loved to have seen it in, in Cremorne, but, um, uh, the, the issues that, that I think we, we, we still have are supply and demand for talent, right? I mean, you know, as, as a business, um, you know, we're, we're constantly faced with supply issues of, around talent. Uh, how do we get hold of, of people that are, that are capable um, and that are interested in, in what we're doing? Um, how do we get more females into, into technology and engineering um, so we get better diversity of talent and capability? Um, and, and that doesn't just apply to, to companies that are you know, our size, it also applies to startups. Um, you know, how, do, how do they get better access to, to resource in order to, in order to grow and evolve their, their, their own businesses? So those comments we were talking about before around collaboration between industry, government and, and education, you know, I think are, are highly relevant to, to not just startups um, or mature businesses like ours. They're, they're, um, they're applicable across the board um, and, and even to non-tech businesses that are all looking to digitise themselves now. Um, in, terms of, in terms of policy settings, I, you know, I, I don't spend enough time um, looking at, at government policy settings around some of this, some of this stuff. All I'd say is um, it'd be just good to see more, um, whatever more looks like, it'd just be good to see more. Um, but, um, you know, it's... it's uh, we, we, as I said before, we should be proud of, of the technology um, uh, ecosystem that we have here in Victoria. And there is, there is great opportunity for us to keep growing it. Um, and if we're supported by government, uh, I'm sure as an industry, we would be um, welcoming of that. And we would be, um, it would certainly help facilitate our growth. And we've got a question about uh, the current war between Google and Facebook. Would you like to um, comment on that and particularly how it affects car sales? That's from Derek from WTFN, their um, TV publishers. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as Derek would know, um, 
Yeah, I mean, Google and Facebook have, have certainly been disruptive. Uh, yeah, they are they are competitors. Um, just like he is a competitor of theirs and we are a competitor of theirs. We're sort of, I'd, I'd call us frenemies. Um, yeah, because we we use Google, and we use um, we use Facebook uh, to help drive our own performance, but um, they're also competitors of ours because they they compete with us for media spend. So, you know, if you think about um, the, the the car companies that exist in in Australia, and we we have if not the most, one of the most competitive car industries in the world, in terms of the numbers of manufacturers that that um, that operate out of Australia and sell cars. Um, so it's very competitive. Um, and, and so we're competing against Google and Facebook for that, for that media spend. And, and, um, and they have been uh, disrupting everyone for a long time. And I go all the way back to directories, um, you know, the Google schmoogle uh, at, at census and they blew up that, that business. And yeah, that business was looking to IPO and that had a, the potential market cap of $10 billion. Uh, and when it eventually got sold to private equity about 2009, it got sold for 600 million. So yeah, they're, I mean, they're very, very aggressive and, and disruptive. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I don't want to comment around yeah, the, the changes that have been made um, as a result of regulatory change around content. But, um, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting dilemma for, for companies like ours because they're, we see them as a, a competitor, but also as a, as a friend. I've got a question from Rowan Martin. And Rowan, sorry for sending a message to you, which was meant to go to Paul. <laughs> I responded appropriately there, Di, so that's okay. <laughs> um, Cameron, Rowan Martin, thanks for your time. Just uh, my question's got two bits. One is just interested in your views around the, the issue of mobility longer term. Um, obviously, we've seen, particularly with new car sales over the last couple of years, you know, some declines in, in those. Um, probably different use of or need for motor vehicles from millenniums. Um, just wondering longer term what, what you think that the impact of COVID may, may have on um, demand, particularly from younger cohorts. And second bit is, are there one or two things that you can share that you and your management team, how you've demonstrably changed uh, in terms of you know, how you actually run the business, not just about Zoom and, and, and the technology, but how you've actually engaged your people over that time? Yeah, no, no, great questions. Um, look, it's fair to say, I was just talking about this yesterday, we, 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 put, we got some of our, our most capable people in 2017 and put together a paper uh, around what we expected to see in 2020. And um, the other day I went back and had a look at it and, and yeah, it's fair to say that a lot of the trends that we thought we'd see in 2020 back in 2017 haven't emerged. Um, yeah, uh, in in 2017, yeah, there was a lot of hype around. Um, you know, I think it was 25% of all cars on the road in 2025 will be electric vehicles. Um, and if I sort of look at the the percentage of electric vehicles that that are on the road today, um, we're not on on that path um, unless something dramatic changes. Mm. Back in 2017, yeah, we we're all talking about shared mobility, um, hailing, um, ride sharing. Um, and uh, and those markets did did take off, um, but they've they've been disrupted uh, over the course of the last six months by by the the pandemic um, that we're dealing with now. But um, yeah, longer term, uh, you'd, you'd have to say that uh, those models potentially will will continue to uh, evolve, um, and you'll probably see people uh, over time move from personal kilometers to commercial to commercial based kilometers so rather than me using my own car i might use someone else's car um, uh, potentially longer term but yeah all those trends have 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 been disrupted by by this pandemic people have moved back into into car ownership um, and I, I suspect that trend will probably continue just looking at platforms um, yeah local platforms in that that have products like um, ride sharing so ride sharing is where i might let you use my car um, and you might drive it 10 kilometers and and then put it back um, the challenge with those sorts of models is 
you know, I don't want you driving my car because you know, you'll, you'll dirty it. Um, I don't know the damage you'll, you'll do to it. Uh, and what we tend to see with those sorts of models is you'll see good demand on the demand side, but you'll see limited supply on the supply side because people just want to, uh, want to avoid that. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's a fascinating um, time out as, as Horst knows, I mean, the automotive industry, the amount of investment going into it mm. around electrification, around autonomous, um, uh, vehicles around um, you know, the connectivity of cars too. I mean, the, if you go back three or four years ago and people were talking about um, uh, point A to point B sort of uh, transport um, in a vehicle would be between 10 and 40% faster and more efficient you know, about now because all cars would be connected. And because cars are connected, you know, you, traffic routing becomes easier, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all that will happen, but it, it, it just it's just not happening as fast as probably what we what we thought. Um, and then the second part of your your question um, was around you know, what have we done with people and so on. And I'd say to you, um, over the last sort of six months, it, at times it's felt like you, you're doing an MBA. Um, you, we're all living an executive MBA at the moment, uh, and and sometimes a day feels like a week, and a week felt like a month, and a month felt like a year, just in terms of dealing with that what was going on um, and all the decisions that needed to be made so quickly. And I think, you know, the, the things that we've done at car sales was to try and simplify all that. And uh, one of the things I'm glad we did was very early in the piece, we decided to come up with a, a framework, right? And the framework would guide all of our decision-making going forward. And that framework was that um, there's three things that we want to make sure we're always doing over the course of the next several months. And if you ask any of the car sales people on the call, they'll say to you that we've drilled this into them. Um, and that is that um, our criteria for all our decisions are we protect our people. Um, we know that this pandemic is short term. Our greatest asset is our people. And when we come out the other end of it, we want to make sure that we're all together as a team because um, we will need to take off again and, and keep moving as quickly as we possibly can. And that's the first thing. The second thing is we must protect our industry as an, as an industry leader. Um, you know, it's our job to make sure that we're protecting our industry as much as we can. And the, the balance between being a public company um, and the expectations of shareholders around delivering earnings growth um, and dividends, you know, that, that was uh, extremely challenging at the start of the pandemic because yeah, our view was we also need to protect our industry and we need to protect the jobs um, that are that our customers um, have employing people. And this was before JobKeeper because we could see it coming because we're, we're watching the traffic and we're watching consumer behavior and we knew it was going to um, really hit our customers hard. So we made some pretty tough decisions very early to protect our industry at the expense of ourselves. And it, it cost us nearly $30 million over, over the course of three months as a, as a public company. Um, that was um, very nerve wracking, but, I, I got to tell you, I, I've been super impressed by the, the way public markets actually dealt. So the, the, the difference between what I thought would happen and what actually happened was extremely different. The market looks at things from the long term and goes, no, that's the right decision that you guys have made. Um, and congratulations. And um, uh, we're happy with that. So that was the second thing. And then the third thing was making sure that we we protect our business. So they were the three um, three elements. And in protecting our business, it was about making decisions to shore up our balance sheet, making decisions to shore up um, you know, cash and viability of our, of our own company as we're sort of, as we're sort of go, going through things. And, and that helped, helped me enormously as, as the leader of the company, just trying to come up with you know, what we need to do and how we need to evolve. Just having that framework to always fall back on um, was, was super helpful. And that's a fantastic way to finish today's session and sadly we're going to have to close but um rowan from mcmillan shakespeare thanks very much for that question um it's um unless paul guerra wanted to uh, say one further thing i'm going to bring the session to the close and sorry we kept you on for a little bit longer no paul yeah, Di, um, just quickly, uh, Neetha, that's the best book on scaling up that I've seen. I was lucky enough to do a lecture with um, Huggy Rao at Stanford. Um, very uh, fascinating man. Um, Cam, thank you for your comments in relation to the Treasurer's announcement today. Um, he texted me at 3.30 a.m. this morning, so I'll be pleased to be able to go back to him with some um, positive feedback um, on it, which is good. 
you asked a question earlier about what I expect on Sunday. Um, I'm probably more pessimistic in terms of versus optimistic, but I do think we'll get at least uh, what was committed um, a couple of weeks back um, on the table. Our position, and I've got a meeting with the state treasurer in just over an hour, our position to him is, and to the Premier is really clear. Um, we're okay with a step on Monday. We would have preferred industries that are starting on Monday to have been told by now so that they could go back with um, purpose on Monday, but it is what it is. We want the rest of the steps pulled forward and we want the trigger points for those steps um, revised to be either more in line with New South Wales or take the healthcare and aged care um, cases out of it so it becomes more achievable or better still. Um, and we know there's work being done on a national standard um, that will go to National Cabinet, adopt those standards so that we then come in line with the rest of the country as well. We need to get going and we need to get going sooner. We understand the the health pandemic side. So um, get that under control, which Victorians have done a great job at doing, and then let's get moving from there. So I'll know more in an hour and a half and happy to provide an update if I find out anything of um, significance. But fantastic talking to you. I'm sure everybody leaves um, this call today a, a lot more wiser and you know, with a lot more insights in terms of, of where you're heading. I'm really pleased to say that the theme that, that you picked up and certainly Sally picked up as well is, is something that we're prosecuting with VIA with the state government of, as well as around bringing all those industry parts, including the unions um, together to work through how do we take the state forward. And um, you'll see a piece from Victorian Chamber on that on, in uh, Monday's Herald Sun as well. If you could also um, just talk to Tim about removing super luxury car tax in Victoria, I think on behalf of myself, and Horst, um, with absolutely, because I mean that's just the most <laughs> ridiculous tax I've ever seen. Um, and no wonder we're not selling cars because we've got all these exotic taxes on stuff. So if you could have a chat to him about that, that'd be great. I will again. I've spoken to him about the fact that I can actually go into New South Wales uh, where that tax doesn't exist. Um, and yeah, well, that's what's happening. That's what you tell him, and I've already given him the data. That's what's happening. New car sales are being are going to New South Wales and South Australia, and we're losing jobs. And yeah, and, um, yeah. But it is one of the frameworks for uh, reform that we're calling for as well. Let's look at the taxes in their entirety, both at a state and a federal level. Absolutely. If people drive used cars on the road, it increases road maintenance. It increases TAC costs because people get hurt and in poor cars, um, they get the, the cost goes up there. So they've got to look at it holistically. Yep. Here, 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 here. Back to you, Thank Di. You. Thanks, Cam. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, everyone, for participating.